fast food is an obvious necessity in all our lives, but it doesn't have to be all briskness and efficiency, which is just as well, because these are not my strong points. The idea here, for me, is food that I love eating, but that doesn't give me a nervous breakdown to cook. I mean, for example, a stir-fry will take hardly any time to cook, but the preparation can seem endless. What I'm after is minimum effort for maximum pleasure in both the cooking and the eating. It's hard to think of food that's faster to cook than pasta, and my lemon linguine is incredibly fast. There are only a handful of ingredients for the sauce. And what's more, you don't even have to cook them. Now, a big pan of water, an incredibly big pan of water. I'm going to salt it now. I don't salt it before because the water actually comes to the boil faster if it hasn't got salt in it. This is quite a lot of salt, I know, but Italians say that the uh, water you cook pasta in should be as salty as the Mediterranean, which is such a wonderful poetic idea in sort of life, food, culture, everything, all in one. I'm going to add the linguine. I love linguine. I mean, you can use any long pasta, it really wouldn't matter. But the point about this is that it's, it's thicker than spaghetti, but not as wide as tagliatelle. Denser, much meatier, which is perfect for a really light, creamy sauce. You don't feel it's being swamped, you just feel it's just what you want. Well, the water's come straight back to the boil, so the sauce. Hmm. Eggs, butter, cheese, Cream, lemons, perfect. Very simple, no cooking. Now, I don't want the whites of these, but I find it much easier just to separate the eggs, cradling them from one hand to the other, rather than in the shell, which most people do, because then I just pierce it, the yolk. Um, if you're squeamish, I wouldn't advise it, but if you're not, I'm not. Then it's fine. Hmm. Other wonderful feeling as it goes through your fingers. The reason I'm beating it like this is because I really want it to get a bit sort of frothier and richer and all to bring out this, to emulsify almost, I suppose, like I was making mayonnaise. But it's nothing as complicated as that. And to aid this, some cheese. I don't think, you don't need to measure this, just grate in as much as you want. Cream. Now, I'm not adding too much. Just enough to make the sauce kind of swathe the pasta rather than drown it. It's rich but it's delicate, which is the best combination. Now my favourite bit, the lemon. I love the way when you zest lemons, you can smell it as you do it. I use a lot of the zest because I think that's the best part of the flavour, better even than the juice. Now again, Really add as much or as little lemon juice as you like. I think just half a lemon is fine. I sometimes do put a whole lemon in, but, you know, these are quite large lemons. And anyway, taste it, you know, and if you want more lemon, add more lemon. And if you've over-lemoned, just add a bit more cheese and a bit more cream. Mmm, so fragrant, so comforting. I haven't added any salt because I think the parmesan is quite salty enough. And um, no pepper for a very good reason. This is harmonious calm, voluptuous and creamy. I think pepper would interrupt that. Suddenly you get this speck of sharp pepper. That's not what I want. So I've drained it. Now I'm putting butter on because the butter shouldn't stop the sauce from clinging to it. In fact, it should almost seem to meld more with the sauce in a minute. But the really important thing is that you don't do this on the heat, because what you don't want is kind of lemony scrambled eggs. You want a really gooey, unctuous sauce. Mm. Mm. I'm leaving some sauce back, because I want to pour some on once it's in the bowl. Well. 
I mean, that's it. And how fast is that? I mean, it's the sort of food you can really, really make when you're so stressed out that the idea of cooking makes you want to shriek. And it smells so wonderful. It smells like the lemon groves of a multi or something. But with the cream in it there, it's just that mellowness, which means you just feel like you're eating liquid velvet. And the last bit, which is I just want to put a teeny bit more lemony emulsion, just pour it on, just to coat it, so it just it looks as wonderful as it will taste. It's going to do a final smattering of cheese, just a slight hint, just to pick up the depths in the sauce. And, just because I find the freshness just so spring-like with the lemons, some parsley. I mean, this is just the quick way, and I quite like having the parsley rather big, and it, like it's another ingredient, not just a decoration. Not just because I'm lazy. This is the Exhausted Mother's Tea Time Special. Jar of tomato sauce. Water. And rice. And what this makes is a really lovely thick tomato and rice soup. Takes 10 minutes. If you use basmati, and you don't do anything. That's me. When I'm really pressed for time, it's the shopping I just can't cope with. So I fill up my deep freeze with all the regular building blocks for my favourite fast food recipes. Bacon, which I freeze in pairs, because it makes the defrosting very, very quick. And bacon is such a good way of giving instant flavour to food. And anyway, I can never be more than two minutes away from a bacon sandwich. Pancetta, which is Italian bacon, incredibly useful in cooking. And it's not that easy to get, so it makes sense when you do get it to stash it away in lots of different pieces so you can just bring it out and not have to go shopping every time you need it. Meat and marinades. This is so useful. If you marinade meat before you freeze it, it will start marinating really well when you stick it in the deep freeze and then it seems to kind of doubly tenderise it as it's thawing. This is beef in chilli and soy and chicken with lemon and garlic, I think, and olive oil. So you take it out in the morning, you get back in the evening and your meat is both thawed and beautifully tender. Peas, how could I leave this out? This is such a useful ingredient. I don't mean just like you know, making peas, we all know about making peas, but as an ingredient in cooking, you can use it in so many ways. But for me, most importantly, it's my upmarket mushy peas. And with my mushy peas, it has to be salmon fillets fried with bacon. I love all fish with bacon fat. Just think it just gives something. Maybe it's the um, hint of the far off sea. Although where salmon comes from, I suspect it's not the sea, but then I'm a city girl, I'm not expected to know these things. My skill lies in eating. And of course, the longer it cooks, this bacon, the more those wonderful sort of salt, sweety juices will go into the fat and give off fat, which is why I've used streaky bacon, not bat bacon. Now, this bacon is really crisp now, which is just how I want it, so that it's almost crunchy against that oily softness of the fish. And, and again, a contrast with the sweet, almost moosiness of my mushy peas. What I've got in here are some garlic cloves. And the benefit of putting them in the water to start off with before I even cook the peas is one, it cuts the, the sharpness of the garlic, making it sweet and mellow. And skins come off much more easily than if you were just peeling them from scratch. So the idea, take the skins off, plonk them back in, throw in the peas, and just cook them for a few minutes, three minutes or so, and then the peas are ready, and then blitz them all. I couldn't live without frozen peas in my deep freeze. I think the snobbery against them is ridiculous, because unless you've got peas in your own garden, there's no advantage in using fresh, because by the time 
you buy them. Or oh, they've all gone to starch anyway, so really I think it is better to use frozen ones. This salmon will need about four minutes, one minute on the first side and then three minutes on the other side just to get lovely and golden and seared. And then I'll just put them on one side while the peas, my lovely pretty pois, get turned into mushy peas. Heaven on the plate, that's the idea. Now for a bit of blitzing. My Jean-Paul Gaultier. Creme fraiche. Don't have to use creme fraiche, but I like the slight soundness because peas are very, very sweet. Butter. Yum. Pepper. Salt. Not much, I might add more if I need it later. And we're off. That's it. Four. So all I have to do now is add this to the salmon. You'll see how beautiful the green of the peas looks against that corally pink of the salmon. I mean, I don't go in for picture book presentation, as you might have noticed, but I love just the beautiful colours of food. Oh, that sounds terrible, but I do. Yum, yum, yum. All you need is a fork. You can eat this in front of the television. I think of my store cupboard, really, as a kind of working partner to my deep freeze, by which I mean I keep these in here that save me from having to go shopping if friends are coming around for supper midweek. Now, three ideas for really fast improvised puddings. You keep a tub of vanilla ice cream in your deep freeze. Sultanas in rum. They're so good, and you can imagine how easy these are to make. And I speak as someone who loathes bought rum and raisin ice cream, so when I say these are delicious, you've got to believe me. Stem ginger. I, I kind of love this stuff. There's something very evocative about it. You eat vanilla ice cream with this. You feel like you're having something off the pudding trolley from some provincial 1950s seaside hotel. Only it's better. And my favourite. This is coffee. So what you do is you make a really strong mug of coffee. You have your bowl full of vanilla ice cream, cold, cold, cold and you pour over a cup of hot espresso. And this makes what the Italians call affogato, which means drowned. So good. And, I mean, could it be easier? Mm -mm. Can you just put the bottom one on top? And then the lights are scooping. Wide hole sit. Oh, I apologise. Actually, it's rather wonderful when it runs out. Yeah. Let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I feel like I'm in one of those really awful, <laughs> bad English porn films of the 70s. Actually, it's very nice. You know how it is when you've invited your friends over for supper in the middle of the week, you think, what a great idea. And then, as the day dawns, you really begin to panic and how you're going to do the shopping, cooking, the lot. I have an answer, because we've all been there, and it's this. A simple two-course supper you can get on the table, really, within half an hour or so of getting back from work. Chicken with couscous and really divinely gooey chocolate puddings. I find it easier to start with a pudding first, I can just get it out of the way and forget about it. And what I've got here is 125 grams of butter. I'm being precise because with baking you do really need to be precise. It's different from just a stew or something. And 
same weight of really good dark chocolate. Then all I'm going to do is stroll over to the microwave and melt them. And the microwave is the best and fastest way to melt chocolate. Two minutes at medium should do it. That's it. While the chocolate and butter are melting, I'm going to add three quarters of a cup of sugar to three eggs I've already stuck in here. And three tablespoonfuls of flour. One, two, three. And just stir this to all the ingredients are combined, and that's all. Great, that's melted perfectly. All I'm going to do is add the egg mixture to the chocolate mixture. And then just pour into four buttered ramekins. It just needs 10 minutes in a hot oven to cook, so I'm not going to put it in the oven until we've more or less finished eating the chicken, which is just so easy. Stash these away until you need them. And then on with the main course, griddled chicken with herb spike yoghurt and couscous. Chicken portions can be a bit tough unless you marinate them. And the lemon is particularly good because the acidity breaks down some of the fibres of the meat. Just a bit of oil. And let's get my favourite bit. Just squish it round in here and really kind of bash it round. Mm -hmm. And this, get rid of the day's stresses. Better to do that before your guests come. And that's it. You know, five minutes will do. Ten minutes is better, but either. Well, in a few minutes, while the chicken's marinating, I'm just going to get on with making a sauce. Now, when I'm up against it, well, one thing I don't want to do is start faffing about with a sort of proper cook sauce. So what I'm going to do is this lovely Greek yogurt sauce with chilli, spring onions and herbs. And when I say Greek yoghurt, I do mean Greek yoghurt, because if you use one of those natural low-fat yoghurts, it'll be so thin and mean, to be frank, just don't bother with the sauce at all. You can use bio at a pinch. Now, into my yoghurt, I'm going to add a couple of spring onions. Some coriander. It's like a drug, it's so strong. Mint. And I'm just going to chop the herbs, and I'm using my mezzaluna. So named because it's the Italian word for half moon, and this is this blade is broadly speaking a half moon shape, and I love this. It is incredibly useful, but I like it because I'm actually incredibly clumsy, and this makes me feel like one of those kind of super competent people. And a couple of cloves of garlic. Now I'm going to lean on the garlic with my considerable body weight. Now, chilli. Trust me, I'm not a doctor. The reason I'm wearing these for my de-seeding operation is because it's the best way, if unglamorous, I can think of, of stopping myself burning my face or my eyes later. I am now showering the whole of the kitchen with seeds. Luckily, I don't have a dog. Actually, I do have a dog. <laughs> Dog's away, though. If you want to, I mean, if you like this really hot, leave the seeds in. But I think only do that if you're dining with someone you're intimate with. And now I'm going to disrobe, de-rubber. And just fold everything in. So... That's it, more or less. Let me just... Mmm. Mmm. Lovely. Now, the chicken's had its ten minutes marinating. 
and I'm just going to whack it on this grill. No oil, because there's oil in the meat, of course. Luckily, I might be able to squeeze this one here. Yep. So now, while the chicken's cooking, really five minutes aside or so, I am going to get on with the couscous, which is so much simpler than you might think. No steaming involved. I'm just going to pour out about, I don't know, a half a litre of water, just hot from the kettle, and then some chicken stock. You can use cubes, but I love this liquid stuff because it melts down very quickly and it tastes fab. This is so simple. You shake out some couscous, which may not look like a lot, but couscous swells, and that's really the wonder of it. Some chickpeas. I've just drained the water out over the sink. Mm. And then, just pour over this. Oh, perfect. I mean, cover the couscous by about two to three centimetres, inch in old money. I'm just going to put this glass on top of that, and frankly, that's all I'm going to do. Hello. Hello. Merci. Chicken should be ready for turning now, so absolutely perfect. Look at that golden stripiness. Gorgeous. I think they'll need about another four minutes, that's all. This grill is so hot. And if you don't have a griddle, well, just use either a frying pan or an ordinary grill inside the oven. Nothing. Just sat on the floor and ate all this food. And then yes, thank you. I hate neat and mimsy foods. I'm just going to have the plate tumbled with lemons. Here we are. Just a bit of paprika, or a lot of paprika. Got Yeah, I think it's better with pure fresh because it's not less than sour. It's a bit more. Home-cooked food should be relaxed and casual. It should reflect our personalities, not our aspirations. Restaurant chefs, they have to innovate to impress the paying customer. But we are under no such obligations. When I invite friends over for supper, I don't want to impress them with my cooking. I want to give them and myself pleasure. people over to eat. You're not inviting them to some grand ambassadorial event. It's just your kitchen, your friends. I know it can be stressful. I once went to a dinner party given by a friend of mine. Really lovely food. But as the evening progressed, she got more and more hysterical. You know, more and more delicious courses, more and more hysteria. By the time the pudding came, you know, we could hear her sobbing <laughs> uncontrollably from the kitchen. I mean, no one wants to get in a state like that, however good the food. My way round this is by having, I suppose, something like a Middle Eastern messe, by which I mean lots of bowlfuls of lovely food all on the table at once. So you're not popping up and down from table to kitchen all evening getting stressed. Just sitting at the table with your friends, enjoying yourselves, which is what it's about.
one of my favourite and regular bits of picky food, a string beans with prosciutto. Really delicious and really easy. I've cooked and drained the beans already and cooled them by running them under the cold tap and now I'm ready for my final assembly. All you need to do to these is get a little bundle, dunk them in balsamic vinegar and wrap them in a bit of parma ham. It looks fussier than the food I often like, but it does taste so good. I know saying wrap anything in something else sounds terribly shishi and a bit 80s, but really they're not, and you can tell that by the way I do them. The point is to provide a wonderful, abundant table. It doesn't matter what you buy and what you make, and you can zhuzh up bought hummus really well by mixing in some Greek yoghurt, maybe an extra squirt of lemon if you think it needs it. The Greek yoghurt just gives a wonderful smoothness. Got my bowls. Now, some olive oil. and some toasted pine nuts. By toasted, I mean just fried in a dry frying pan for a few minutes until they go golden and brown. And when they're in season, you can use pomegranate seeds here too, which is very Lebanese and very delicious. OK, a quick jaunt from the eastern Mediterranean to Mexico. Guacamole. I love this guacamole. I mean, of course I do. It's the one I make. I've got six scooped out avocados here, and now I have some spring onions on top of them, some wonderfully finely chopped green chilli, limes, the crucial edge, most important ingredient after avocados. This rima means that you get a lot of pulp out from the limes too, which is great here, but you know, use any instrument you want. I'm using the juice of four limes here, but you might want to add more, you might want to add less. This is so much a matter of taste. Mm. That's great. Now, my tip. Add the salt to the juice in the jug so the salt dissolves, and then you get that wonderful salty intensity spread throughout the guacamole, not just in selected lumps. And mash. Fork's fine. What I want is a soft, chunky texture. I don't want this too finely mushed up. Of course, this makes it lighter work as well. Enough chopping. Now, this is just how I like it. Let me just taste to see if it needs anything else. Mm-mm. Perfect. Just coriander. A wonderful leafy blanket of it. Mash some in, leave some on the top, and that is the vine. So, you know, tidy it up a bit. I'm not a great stickler for neatness, but I think a quick wipe down will make it look better. Salads are the only foodstuff I'm a purist about. It has to be a green salad or a red salad. I eat tomatoes. This, you can see, is a green salad. John is making the most fabulous drink. We kind of live off it during summer. Sweet, fizzy white wine. Moscato d'Asti, if you can get it, this is Asti Spumanti. It's sort of adapted from a River Cafe recipe with the juice of five limes per bottle. It is so wonderful, addictive. You should try it. It's a really last minute dish, but it's incredibly easy and incredibly quick. Tiger prawns with garlic and chilli. Just warming, sizzling the garlic and chilli. 
and then tossing in these prawns and just watch as they turn pink. Alchemy, so incredible. Just a splash of white wine, lid on, a few minutes steaming to be cooked and that is really it. Going to see if you're in. Oh, I was in last night, but. Everyone seems to love Caesar salad, and when you've got friends around to eat, it is really very adaptable. Obviously, it makes a great starter, but I think it makes a really wonderful light main course, too. In place of the usual croutons, I roast sliced small potatoes in garlic-infused olive oil, which is a bit of salt will I get on with a dressing. A couple of eggs, just boiled for a minute. Not cooked, just warmed through. And a match, don't ask me, it's my great aunt's tip. She said that if you put a match into the water when you cook an egg, if the shell cracks, the white doesn't flow into the water. I do what I'm told. Well, it is lovely cause. Dressing is simple, bit of olive oil. A few drops of Worcester sauce. A bit of salt. Lemon. I like this bit. Now just toss this so that you've got a kind of wonderful, well, like a thin mayonnaise coating. Obviously, the eggs are not cooked. I mean, one minute doesn't cook them, so use eggs that you feel confident about. Wonderful parmesan. Quite a bit. You want to taste the cheese. So the last bit of tossing so that everything is mixed and... So a bit of a degunge operation. Final bit of cheese over. A few more potatoes. Mm. I do love this. I don't go in for formal dinner parties. Even when I'm having a dinner to mark some really special occasion, I like to keep things simple, which for me means, on the whole, no starter, just main course and pudding. Hello. Um, I need a line of pork. Bye, see you. What I need from you, please, is a kilo of rhubarb. A kilo of rhubarb on its way to you. Looking out here after today, my darling. I don't think so. I mean, I know that there will be something that I don't know I'll have forgotten, but I'll have to come back. Well, we're here till half six. Mm -hmm. Making a drop-dead gorgeous pudding doesn't mean attempting something so demanding that you're completely stressed out by it. The key for me is something that can be made in advance. I am mad for jellies. They are incredibly easy to make, and this one is one of my favourites. It's a lovely pink one made out of rhubarb and muscat wine. And the reason why jellies are so easy to make 
because of this. Looks like a fairy tale castle window. It is leaf gelatin. So wonderful. Much easier than the powdered salt, which I cannot make work. They just need to be softened in cold water for about five minutes, just until they feel like jelly and not stiff anymore. I'm using 10 for this jelly. They come in packets of eight. While the gelatin's softening, I'm going to strain the rhubarb. One of the benefits of poaching rhubarb in the oven is that it holds its shape well and it keeps its colour, which is useful here because I don't want all stringy bits of rhubarb in the liquid. I want a nice clear jelly and also because I want it as pink as possible. It's a kilo of rhubarb chopped with 350 grams of sugar, zest and juice of one orange and half a litre of water. Just cover with foil and cook in a moderate oven for an hour. And although I'm not going to use all the pulp in the jelly, it's incredibly useful. You either just freeze it and use it in tarts or just eat it with custard, or I quite like it eaten with Greek yogurt for breakfast. I'm going to pour the rest now. So gloriously pink. All natural. No makeup. I'm trying to shake out the maximum amount of juice, but I don't want to push it because then it'll make the jelly cloudy later. I want it jewel bright. For the rest, it's easy. Pour in some Muscat wine to make it up to one and a half litres. And how very satisfying, because that's the whole of this bottle, which is, in fact, a half bottle. Nothing wasted. Taste. See if I need to add more sugar or anything. Mmm. It's so good. Like a grown-up version of those rhubarb sweets with custard that I used to eat as a child. Now we're ready for the gelatine stage. But before I do that, I'm just going to pour a bit of liquid out into a saucepan, because it's easier to dissolve the actual gelatine into a small amount of liquid. Put the flame under it just for a bit, because I don't want it boiling just hot. And now, for my favourite bit, squeezing out the gelatine leaves. There's something so curiously satisfying about all that squelching. Oh, how lovely is this? Look. Yeah. Creature from the deep. Right, that's hot enough. So I'm just going to... Oh, lovely. And it's dissolved. The reason I turn the flame off first is that if jelly boils, it goes stringy. A proper jelly needs a proper mould, one with lovely crenellations or castles, something bulging and old-fashioned. You need to oil it first, I know, vegetable oil, almond oil, nothing that will interfere with the taste of the jelly. Just wipe it around with a bit of kitchen towel. If your jelly mould has got a lid, but not all do, remember to oil the lid as well. Just leave to cool slightly before chilling in the fridge. I like to leave a jelly for at least six hours, but mostly I just do it the day before, like today. Oh, actually, let me show you my wine slushes. This is red wine, white wine, both frozen. And what I do when we have people around for supper and there's wine left over, you know, in the bottle, but I'm afraid to say it's actually also sometimes in people's glasses, I pour it out into plastic bags and stick it in the deep freeze so that if I ever need just, say, a glass for a stew or something, I don't have to open a whole bottle. And I know that wine snobs will say this is the most atrocious thing you can do, but I'm telling you it works very well indeed. party doesn't mean to say you have to start swinging from the chandelier, culinarily speaking. One of my celebratory regulars is loin of pork with bay leaves. It's simple, but it's elegant. And when it's finished cooking and it's carved and it's laid out to cover a huge plate, circled with bay leaves, it looks so wonderful and welcoming and abundant. And that's what I always want from food. 
What I'm really thinking about here is maximum flavour for minimum effort, useful when you're cooking for a lot of people, which is why I'm not even bothering to peel this onion, just slicing it. It's true, the skin will give a lovely golden colour to the gravy later. The real reason I'm not peeling it is just out of laziness rather than as a, to use it as a dye. This is going to go into the pan, but first, some lovely garlic-infused olive oil. You can use ordinary olive oil with garlic, but this is quicker, and it means you don't get any burnt shards of garlic later. Now the onion, my flaw of flavour and flaw for the pork. On top of that, bay leaves. Lovely fresh bay leaves. Use dried if you can't get fresh. And then, this wonderful loin of pork on its little flavour platform. I asked the butcher to give me the bones he'd taken out and I'm plonking them here because they will give such a wonderful porky flavour to the gravy and also because I do like to make sure I get my cook's treat. Now the rub, which I love, and it's just more garlic-infused olive oil, peppercorns and some dried bay leaves, just simply because it's easier to sort of crunch them down. Final touch, some salt, nice coarse salt, beautiful. And that's it, just in a moderately hot oven for about just under two hours. An hour and three quarters is when I'll look at it. This is perfect. Close the oven. It's just that wonderful golden burnish colour, which comes from, in part, these bones, and also because of the onion skin. Just take the meat and try and strain out these juices without causing major damage. Every last bit of juice out of the onions. I think of this as gravy, but it's not normal gravy in that I'm not using flour to thicken it. All it is is those wonderful oniony pork juices, which I'm going to boil down, and 150 mils of water, and about the same amount of wine. But you don't have to be precise. You can't tell until I've tasted it, I can't tell what I need more of. Just hope I don't need less of anything. My special tasting spoon. And of course, by letting it boil for a bit, you can also reduce it and make it thicker and slightly more syrupy. Mm. Just while I'm waiting for the juices to reduce a bit more, a really spectacularly good part of the whole exercise Mmm. My spare ribs. Mmm. Very delicious. Now for my salad. Parsley is the first and major ingredient, and I'm not using the parsley as a herb, but as the main ingredient. You know, I want bulk. Perfect. Second ingredient, red onion. Easiest way to fill that, just take the ends off. Cut in half, take off the skin. And just cut in half moons. It's beautiful that way. Rain these down. And my third ingredient, capers. I really balance these two incredibly well. These have been packed in salt, which does make them really too salty. So I've been soaking them in water. Mm. You can use capers that have been stored in vinegar. They won't be as good as this, but if you can't find salted capers, do not worry. 
Lovely. These are salty enough. I'm not going to add any more salt. Olive oil. Mm. Lemon. Not much lemon. Like. Once you make this salad, you find you just find an excuse to make it over and over again. Not that you need an excuse. Pleasure is reason enough. Carving's not my strong point, so be kind. But what you want are lovely thin slices, which you then pile up in the centre of a huge plate. And then, although I don't normally go in for prinking, uh, what I do is a final Napoleonic flourish, which is a circle of bay leaves all around the piled up pork on the plate. It looks wonderful. A bit of gravy ladled on now will stop the meat drying out if it has to sit for a bit. And if it has to sit for a lot, then just tent it with some tin foil. And then the rest of the gravy you can keep in a sauce boat and people can just help themselves on the table. I'm thrilled. I don't think it needs anything else. has always played a hugely important part of my family's life. If we're not eating it, then we're talking about it. And that goes for my extended family of friends too. But then, food always has to be more than just fuel. It's what brings us, brings our memories together. And family food is comfort food. And we all have certain things that, you know, when you eat them, you feel instantly better. love eating, well, in common with lots of us, is the food that my mother cooked when I was a child. And this is my desert island dish. If I could choose the last meal I'd eat on earth, her beef with sauce bernets. Oh, and afterwards, I would have to have my granny's pears belalin, which is poached pears with vanilla ice cream and the most dark, luscious chocolate sauce. Mm -hmm. But now I'm just going to light the griddle. It should take about five minutes to heat up, which is about the right time to do the sauce. Three egg yolks. If you were to look up sauce bernets in the Larousse Gastronomique, you would be told to start with a reduction of shallots, white wine, chervil, tarragon, various other things. Now, I don't do it that way, not out of any disrespect, just because I do it the way my mother did, which tastes great to me, which is really a question of just mixing Egg yolks with some dried tarragon, a bit of tarragon vinegar, just a bit, and salt, 
and whisk away over this pan of simmering water, but the base shouldn't touch the water, and nor will it. And just whisk away, adding butter until it thickens. A bit like, just think of it as hot mayonnaise with herbs in it. When I was a child, one of us used to have the job of chopping the butter into cubes, and the other would be stood on a chair, propped up right near the stove, and whisking. And actually, this is the best way to learn. That's why I learned to make this by watching, like, like you're watching now. You, co you can't learn to cook in a better way. I suppose that's one of the reasons why I'm so fond of this, and why I now am a great believer in child labour and make my children stand on stools, stirring hot sauces. And they learn not to burn themselves, too. I know a lot of people are quite anxious about sauces like this with egg yolks and butter because they can split or curdle. But that's why I dredged on my pan full of cold water. Because if it does get overheated, if the sauce looks like it's curdling, well, all I'm going to do is just lift up this pan, plunge it there so the temperature immediately drops, whisk like crazy, and then it should see off any problem. And I'm not saying that will happen or that you should worry, but I really think in life, if you prepare for the worst, then it may not happen. It pays to be patient because you just want to add another cube as one melts. Because if you go slowly, the sauce will thicken wonderfully, just like when you make mayonnaise, you add the oil slowly. And if you do in one huge heap, you'll just find it difficult to keep the heat up. It's a bit more butter. And as you get a good solid lump of sauce, then you can start adding more butter in at one time. So all my butter is absorbed, and just time for a lovely bit of lemon, just to sharpen it up. Just do it by eye and then by taste. Well, that's that done for now. All I'm going to do at the end is add some freshly chopped tarragon just to spruce it up. But for now, I'll leave it and get on with the beef. This is a cut I really like. What it is, it's an inch thick along the whole of the top rump. And you cook it like a steak, but then afterwards slice it really thinly on a diagonal like that, which makes it taste so succulent and actually makes it go a lot further. So that's great. One of the rules about griddling is oil the meat and not the griddle. Because if you oil the griddle, it'll just smoke like hell. I'm not saying it won't, <laughs> but here goes. Mm. I like my beef really underdone, so I'm only going to give this about two minutes aside. Mm. I love a bit of tong action. Now, if you haven't got a griddle, do not worry. You can use a domestic grill if it's hot enough. You can use a frying pan, you can use the oven, just remembering, cook this as a steak. I look at it from its thickness, don't weigh it. I think it's going to be ready to turn now. Wow, it's wonderful. All tiger stripes. Yum, yum. Then another few minutes and that'll be perfect. And that's it, really. Not too much work for the most fantastic meal. Well, this looks ready for me, so I'm just going to let it rest for a while on my board. Oh, turn this off. A bit of salt. Meat should be salty. Now, the reason why you leave meat to rest is that when it's hot and on a pan, all its juices near the outside, so if you just cut through it, the juice will just run out and all the flavour with it. Whereas if you let it sit just for a few minutes, the juices go all the way through the centre, making the whole cut really succulent and delicious. So I've got to add some tarragon to my sauce. It's just a teeny weeny bit of fresh tarragon, just to spruce it up, and just because that gives you a lovely sort of herbal hit at the end, but not too much. You'll feel you're in the middle of some new mown hay. That's enough. Yum, yum, yum. So that's it. I'm just going to leave it there. Don't worry about it cooling down because it should be at room temperature. The beef. I wanted to show you one thing is that I like my beef really underdone and you can tell how well beef is cooked without stabbing it simply because if you press it and it feels really soft and, and sort of yielding, that means it's underdone. If it's a teeny bit bouncy, it means it's medium. And you don't need to tell me if it's hard. You know, it's, like, it's, it's well done. So this feels lovely and soft and buttery. And I'm going to start slicing into it diagonally across. I am the world's worst carver, which is probably one of the reasons why I like this cut. I can't resist this just like this now.
Hang on. Mm. Traditionally, you should have chips, which I think is making things quite stressful. And I love it just with a green salad and a baguette. So you can dip the baguette into all this lovely buttery sauce and into those wonderful red juices. Mm. 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 I think my mummy would be proud of me. My granny's pears bella len. Poached pears, vanilla ice cream, and hot, thick, dark chocolate sauce. The pears just peeled, halved, and cored, and they're just poached in a vanilla syrup. And that is really just water, sugar, and a vanilla pod, nothing scary. This is the easiest chocolate sauce you could imagine. Just a couple of bars of chocolate, half a cup of sugar, I like to use instant espresso powder because you can just pour on the water and then sprinkle over the powder. Don't even have to reconstitute it. But of course, use any instant coffee or indeed real coffee that you like. And then you just pour in the cream, stir again, and that's it. This sauce is so good to have in your repertoire. You can use it to zhuzh up any tub of bought ice cream. And right at the end, if you sprinkle over some finely chopped pistachios, it adds colour and wonderful crunch. So good, sweetheart. is marmite and butter blended together. This is how I make marmite sandwiches. Sounds mad to be suggesting a shortcut when it's not exactly a lengthy procedure. But when you've got lots of children, you do want to make them very, very quickly, all in one go. There's one spreading only, and they do make the best marmite sandwiches in the world. Do you want, do you want your sandwiches? Do you want to come and get them? Come on, Joe. It's marmite. He thinks it's peanut I know, it looks like peanut butter. Have these, I'll make some more. It's good as a mum, mate. It's great. <laughs> Not all the influences on the food I cook come from my family. Some of them come from what I think of as my acquired family, which is my library. <laughs> And I am a complete food book junkie. I mean, every single book in this room, and there are plenty on the floor, are food books. I mean, some of them are, I've just picked up out of a sort of obsessiveness, but some of them have played an enormous part of my life. I mean, this book, you can see just from the cracks in the spine how much it's been read. And, uh, and Anna Del Conte, who's written it, is, I'd say, sort of the greatest maternal influence on my life uh, in the kitchen, you know, after my mother. And another woman, too, has played that sort of role uh, that I feel very moved and influenced by her writing, and that's Claudia Roden. And this book has a recipe in it, which I cook so often. It's for tagliatelle with chicken. It's from Venice. And I've cooked it so often in the few years since this book came out that I now feel, you know, did I actually eat this in my childhood? You know, I, surely I couldn't just have been eating it for the last few years. Oh, perfect. Couldn't be simpler either. This roast chicken is to go with tagliatelle, and I'm going to make a sauce out of the lovely juices. What I'm just going to do is rather fabulously prong this beast and get rid of it for a while to get a bit cooler. I have to train myself to use oven gloves because I'm covered in burns. Pour these wonderful brown juices from the chicken, which is really just a bit of olive oil. and add some toasted pine nuts, not that many, just a bit. A wonderful gold on gold. Some sultanas, which I've soaked in water. And some rosemary. Not too much, because it is very aromatic. You just want a subtle taste of it, rather than a 
incredibly soapy hit. One of the reasons why I'm really fond of this recipe, well, obviously, apart from the way it tastes, which is wonderful, is that it comes from Venice, and that's where I got Mario, so... Now, chicken. Time for a bit of dismembering and surgery. Nothing I like more. I've got hands like asbestos, but you can use a knife and fork if you want, or just leave it to get a bit cooler. But I like pulling it apart with my bare hands. I'm doing this like this because I want nice rough chunks, nothing neat and elegantly sliced. You're going to have to be patient with me. This is going to take some time. I want the whole of this chicken, including the skin. Can I dust? wipe my hands, because this gets very messy. Which I have to say I rather like, but... Now, tagliatelle. It's much better to let the chicken sit about and never the pasta. Mm. That's it. Come on, babies. This will take about four minutes, no more. So I'll just heat my sauce up. And get rid of the chicken. I want to keep bones for stock, and I'm not going to wash this up, because it's got all the lovely chickeny bits from when the chicken was sitting in there. Well, that's about the size of it. Tally Tally have to cook. Sauce has to get warm. That is so wonderful. I'm just going to taste the pasta. I like to test it about a minute before it says, just in case. Mm -hmm. Just as well, because it's perfect. So now, I'm going to throw cold water over it. This brings down the temperature straight away, and the delicate pasta like this won't get overcooked. Great, now I'm going to move fast before this goes claggy. Mmm. Pour half these lovely juices over. Just the Italians never use as much sauce as we do. Just have to be a bit more patient as you toss it through. Coming over with my meat. Mm. Oh, this is just family food at its best. And now the last half of the chicken juices. And that's it. I'm going to freeze this chicken carcass. And even though you can't make any stock just with one carcass, I like to freeze them as I go along and build up a supply till I've got enough. And to that end, if I'm, at, if I'm at a friend's house and we're having roast chicken for lunch, I just ask them if I can hit the carcass back home with me and I flash it in my deep freeze at home and then I'm a bit nearer to having it off the stock. I love cooking with my children and one of their favourite things to make are green cakes. A mix of broccoli, peas, and cold potatoes, all mashed up and bound with an egg. Look. Yeah, Daddy, clever. Very good, Mimi. That's, no, sweetheart, that's the rind, so we just want you to put this bit like that. Put your fingers underneath the little sharp. Salmon. With salmon. With what? Salmon. With salmon. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dip them in mozza meal or breadcrumbs and fry them till they're lovely and crispy. <laughs> it's a great way, i found, to get children to eat vegetables. Not that I'm promising anything. Mm. <laughs> 
I'm sometimes extravagant, but I am never wasteful. I can't throw anything away. I can't even throw away an egg white. But why would you want to? I stash them in my deep freeze, and then when I want to, I can make meringues. Or better still, pavlova. That we make this pavlova so often at home, I can't work out whether in years to come, my children will either absolutely be passionate about it or never be able to face one again. But whatever. They will need, if they're going to make it, four egg whites. Mine are defrosted in batches of two, because that's how they were in the deep freeze. And if you've got a mangy old lemon knocking about, like I always seem to in my fridge, then it's really helpful if you just wipe it round the inside of your bowl, because that will get rid of any grease and means that the egg whites bulk up beautifully and a bit faster. Now, the egg whites. Two in. Second two. Now I get to use my favourite toy. Just turn on and whiz. And I can just watch it do anything, find my nails. But this should take us about a couple of minutes. I'm not going to beat them too fast. Or maybe I am. I get so impatient. Come on, live a little. What I'm looking for, for the egg whites to be holding firm peaks, not stiffly whipped, just at that smooth, firm peak stage, which looks about... Now... Right, so now, the sugar. Just whisking very gently to fold it in. For each egg white, you need four tablespoons of sugar. A tablespoonful is a precise measurement in cooking. It's 15 mils, or if it helps, think of 15 mils as three teaspoons. Three cowpole spoons. Last one. And now, I'm going to turn this meringue into pavlova. Watch. One teaspoon of wine vinegar. I know it sounds odd, and it is odd, but it works. and two teaspoons of corn flour. These two ingredients keep the belly of the meringue wonderfully chewy and marshmallowy, which is what a pavlova should be. A few drops of real vanilla. I'm going to fold these in rather than using the whisk because I want a lot of air in. I want to do it gently. Just spoon under and over so as not to lose any air, but don't worry about incorporating everything within a centimetre of its life. And then pile it onto the tin. You don't have to do this, but if you've just got a, any old sandwich tin, it's about 20 centimetres in diameter, and then fill in here. Or just do it, or just pile it in without making any sort of measurement. It's not crucial. But I want this to be thick and gooey in the middle, not a shallow disc. Mm, lovely. Don't get too hung up, though, about doing the perfect circle. This is just ordinary home cooking. It's not meant to be perfection. Anyway, it's what it tastes like that matters. I think I'm just going to get a spatula to make the sides smooth. And that's it. To the oven. Hotter oven than you might think for meringue. 180, gas mark 4. But there's a reason. I want the meringue to go in the heat and so crisp up on the outside, but then I'm turning it down to 150, gas mark 2, so that the inside cooks more slowly and stays soft and marshmallowy. The perfect pav. This is not only ready but completely cold because I find if you let a meringue cool in the oven gradually and the oven itself loses temperature, it stays chewy. Now for the unveiling. 
This is a tip I learnt from Stephanie Alexander, the Australian food writer. It's her family way of doing it. You invert it and put it on your serving dish with the soft bit that's been next to the paper on top so the cream that's piled all over this melds all this marshmallowy bit of meringue. And the bottom and sides are crisp. Perfect. I've used the same toy to whisk the cream. <coughs> Just pile it over, nothing neat. Neatness is something beyond me. That's it. And now the fruit. I'm a real single fruit person when it comes to pavlova. I don't like a fruit salad on top of it. And I think it works really well using passion fruit, just scooping them out with a teaspoon. Because the sourness, the aromatic sourness of the passion fruit works so well against the sugary sweetness of the meringue. Red currants and blackberries are good. I don't really like strawberries for the reason that they aren't sour enough. Although, having said that, the last ones I bought really were, so... Anyway, you use what you want. This is all personal taste, and that's so important, as always, is that I'm not telling you what taste you should have. I'm just telling you what I think. Mmm. And here it is. Cooking isn't performance art, it's about making yourself something to eat and becoming familiar with the rhythms of the kitchen. So the more you cook in an everyday kind of a way for yourself or for whoever you live with, the more confident you'll become. And in fact, some food is at its best when cooked small scale, perfect for when you're home alone. I've never understood it when people say they're too busy to eat lunch, or even that they forget. However busy I am, I always find time to eat. This is one of my favourite and most regular lunches. It's a salad with pancetta, which is like Italian bacon, and cheese. This is what pancetta looks like in the block. This wonderful slab of streaky bacon, really. Uh, but you can buy it in the supermarket already cubed if you can't get this from a butcher, although do ask, we're deli. Otherwise, buy, you know, the French lardot, they, those are easily available in supermarkets and tubed and in packets. Yum, yum. I love the smell of bacon. Put a bit of oil in first, just to help all the bacon juices and the fat render down. And this is another very easy bit. You take a packet of designer leaves, open it, tumble them out, and that's the base of your salad. Mm. The bacon is looking so wonderful, and the smell, all the juices going into the oil, which will be the dressing. Okay, we're ready to roll on this. Ah. Turn the heat off. Just lift the bacon bits, the pancetta, onto the salad. Right, off the heat, teeny bit of olive oil, just to add to the bacony juices to make the dressing, and a bit of Dijon mustard or any mustard you want. And this does splutter, so watch it and stand well back. 
Mmm. Such a lovely dressing. And some red wine vinegar. I nearly always prefer red wine vinegar not, you know, to white wine. Mmm. Look at that, isn't it great? And this is the dressing. Lovely. Then just toss to disperse it a bit. Lovely. And then, this is cheddar, but you can use any hard cheese. Parmesan, provolone, gruyere. Or you could just crumble in some blue cheese if you wanted. Just a few bits with the vegetable peeler. Mm, such a nice lunch. And really not harder than making a sandwich. It's surprising how little you have to do to zhuzh up the everyday ingredient and make it so special. For example, to go with my lamb chops here, I'm making a no-cook tahini sauce which really kind of zings it up. I've marinated the chops in here with some onion, just roughly sliced, you don't have to go in for any fine chopping olive oil, lemon zest and cumin, which has the most wonderful sort of earthy and sharp aroma more than flavour actually, at the same time and it just makes these really resonant and rich. Tahini is sesame paste and it looks a bit like a kind of clay version of peanut butter. It's just three gloopy spoonfuls. A garlic clove. I'm grating this, but you can mince it or, you know, put it through a crusher if you want. This is the easiest for washing up. Some lemon, and the lemon really undercuts the sesame paste because it can be very rich like all nuts. And then stir. When you start stirring, when the lemon goes in at first, you will feel that it's all kind of slightly seizing up a bit and getting sort of less velvety rather than more, but that is just what happens, and then it goes back later to a lovely creamy texture. So, no panic. Lovely, 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 lovely. And now just thin it with water. Mm, what you're looking for is the consistency of double cream. And then just to echo the flavours in the marinade, some more of this wonderful sort of grassy, earthy cumin. Salt. That's the sauce done. I'm ready to eat. The reason why I turned the chops really quickly when I first put them on and then just left them on that one side was because I wanted the sides seared, but it doesn't really matter which side you're going to cook them on. They're very light and, as you saw, took hard any time. Spinach I've got here, I cooked earlier and just left a drain and a sieve over a pan because I wanted all the excess juice to run away and because I love spinach at room temperature. I love spinach full stop, actually. sesame seeds just to echo the flavours in the sauce and now the sauce itself just dollop some on here drizzle a bit on the spinach wonderful together a bit of a greedy pig, which I know is hardly news, but as a consequence of that, every now and then I have to mm, 
does practice a little bit of dietary restraint. And I, what I do when I'm just cooking for myself particularly is focus on the food of Southeast Asia because it's food that's naturally low in fat and high in flavour and that makes your life very much easier. So here is my basic kit. Soy sauce in industrial quantities, fish sauce, sake, rice wine and dashi which is Look, isn't that a lovely box? Which is Japanese soup and stock base and essential for those restorative broths, you know, to make you feel sort of virtuous and light. Any little help I can get. And plum seasoning, which is really a sort of plum vinegar. Really wonderful, sort of deep puce pink and so tangy and great, say, on broccoli or any veg. And I always, when I'm in this sort of mood, keep huge quantities of limes. Now the only drawback with the limes, great though the juice is for this sort of cooking, is that they go wrinkled and dry after a while. So before that happens, I squeeze the juice and freeze it in bags either like this or more often in uh, ice cube trays. And what I also keep in the deep freeze is essential ingredient, lime leaves, which you buy frozen, keep frozen and just snip and put into stocks, soups, anything you need. And what all these ingredients do is give you maximum flavour for minimum calorie intake. And let's be frank, what more does a girl need? Cooking for one or two of you is a really good way of practising, experimenting. And if you have never cooked shellfish before, you'll be amazed at how easy it is. You need about 500 grams of mussels per person. And I'm just going to leave mine there in the sink of cold water to soak for about three minutes while I get on with my flavour base. So, Southeast Asian mussels. Hot water. and then chilli finely chopped, and I've de-seeded it so that I have all the warmth, but not too much fire. Beautiful little red jewels. You can use green chilli, I just love the look of the red with it. Garlic sliced finely across, so you can really chew on the bits of garlic rather than just have it crushed. Likewise the ginger, which is in teeny shreds, and that gives its wonderful kind of heat and that restorative quality to the broth. And shallots although you could use spring onions if you wanted. And then the lime leaves. I love lime leaves. Wonderful aromatic sour quality. Mm. Ah, beautiful. Now, juice of half a lime. There's something about limes, I don't know, that so kind of refreshingly astringent and I think more aromatic than lemons. Half should be plenty. Some fish sauce. This is wonderful just for adding a sort of Thai or Asian flavour to food. It's what makes it taste authentic. And you can get it at any supermarket now. Last of all, something I love. Sake, which has a kind of resiny, smoky flavour. If you don't get some near you, use dry sherry. That, that will work too. And as it comes back to the boil, all the flavours will just flow into the water and then later will merge with the water that the mussels themselves will give off when they're steaming. <gasps> Heavenly broth. And not one ounce of fat on it. Right, so I'm just going to leave the flavours to infuse as long as it takes me to sort through the mussels. And really, you don't need to be at all alarmed about dealing with shellfish. It's so easy to work out which ones are okay and which ones not. If the mussel is closed, then it's fine. If it's open and stays open after you wrap it, then discard it. That's all you have to remember. And actually, you, you're not likely to find that many mussels that do stay open, simply because mussels that are sold now tend to be already cleaned and sorted through. Once they're all sorted, you can plunge them into the pan of hot broth to steam open. Mm, that smells wonderful. Shortly to be even more wonderful. Heat up. And then, these just be plunged in. Oh, love that. Lid back on. 
heat up and leave them to steam for a couple of minutes. And you know, you can see that it makes sense to cook something like this for two people because I've used a pretty big pan as it is. If you're cooking for eight, you need a catering size pan. Great, well, after a couple of minutes, you can check and see how they're doing. And these are doing very well. A little shake. Just to make sure that the mussels which were at the bottom come to the top, lid back on, and another couple of minutes should do it, which gives me plenty of time to get up my bowls. A bit of coriander, which is just the perfect herb for sprinkling on top. mussels are cooked, I said, throw away any that stayed open. The rule for after they've been cooked is throw away any that stay closed. Don't panic about it, just throw them away. So raw, throw away open mussels, and cooked, throw away closed mussels. That's it. Yum, yum. Now the lovely, lovely aromatic broth. And coriander. And taste. Mm. Feel better already. We all seem to live on pasta these days. And while there's nothing wrong in pesto from a jar, my fresh deconstructed version takes minimal effort. I mean, like these pine nuts, which I'm just pushing around in a dry, hot pan so that they toast and get all sort of golden and aromatic. Now that they're nice, golden and toasty, I'm just turning them out of the pan so that I can scatter them over later. But that's it, really, as far as cooking is concerned. I'm going to use some oil that's already been infused with garlic. I don't normally like fancy messing around with food, but actually infused oils are incredibly useful when you're all short of time. It just saves you one whole stage. Now, instead of grating the cheese as it would be in proper traditional pesto, I'm just using a vegetable slicer because I want to have some structure. Toasted pine nuts. And I'm just going to tear some basil over. And a bit more cheese. And I mean, that's just it, and it's ready to serve and eat. Just we're like that in the pan. Let me show you some of my buried treasure. And when I say buried, I do mean buried because the state of my deep freeze is pretty appalling. Now, what I keep in here, the sort of foods I love eating when I'm by myself, like stew, which I just look frozen individually in bags, and then I eat it lying on the sofa out of a bowl with a spoon watching TV. My idea of heaven. And what else can I... Oh, corals. I love these. Snip them off the scallops when I'm cooking scallops and then save them for when I'm alone. Just fried with butter and garlic and spread on toast. So good. And my real, real solitary treat, if I can find it, or mainly because no one else wants to eat it with me, pig's ear. Boil, snip it up, and then deep fry it. I love this. My real, real solitary indulgence. But don't worry, this really is for when I'm by myself and I'm not going to cook it now. When you've got to cook for the two of you, but just don't have the energy for any high-level culinary activity, the one-pan method kind of completely saves the day. And it's as straightforward as it sounds. Two portions of chicken, new potatoes quartered, just arrange them around the bits of chicken in the dish. The idea is to cut everything into sizes so that all ingredients cook at the same time. One lovely red pepper, quartered, seeded, and then cut those quarters lengthwise 
in half again so you've got lovely juicy strips. These go in the pan as well. One red onion, just cut it in half and then cut each half into four, really so you've got segments. Again, I don't bother to peel. You can use any ingredients you want. These are just the ones that I use most regularly. If you're vegetarian, it'd be lovely, for example, if you just missed out the meat and it put some feta in or goat's cheese right at the end. And for two, I've got eight cloves of garlic, because I love garlic. They're in their skins. You know, I haven't bothered to peel them, and that means they almost steam inside their skins and go wonderfully sweet. Some oil over. Just olive oil, not extra virgin. And sprinkle thyme all over. It's such a wonderful herb with chicken, and indeed with vegetables. And that is it. And all I need to do now is put this in a hot oven for about an hour. Serve a green salad if you want with, but that's a meal in its entirety and you don't have to do anything while it's cooking, which is sometimes just what you need. Mmm! I take it to the table just like this. I think it looks lovely in its roasting tin. Tastes good too. Can I have two 150 grams of the raw prawns, please? Some food has to be eaten the minute it's cooked. Now I know I act as if all food has to be eaten the minute it's cooked, but fried food cannot stand around. But if you cook fried food for lots of people, you end up feeling like the kitchen skivvy, getting hotter and hotter as you're doling out food for everyone to eat elsewhere. So I like to make these prawn cakes when I've got a friend coming around, and I have got a friend coming around now. So you can eat them as they should be eaten, hot and straight out of the pan. And the thing about eating these prawn cakes, just the two of you as well, is that it feels like a stolen treat, which it is a bit. And for these prawn cakes, you need a clove of garlic, a couple of spring onions, just snipping them roughly before they're blitzed. Just like that. And then, and this is so easy, 250 grams of raw prawns, They'll have been frozen, but that's fine as long as they're thawed. I mean, the important thing is that they're raw. And 50 grams of flour. This is just to bind the cakes together when they fry. A splosh of sherry, and by splosh, it's a technical term, you understand. I mean a tablespoon or so. And blitz again. And that's your prawn cake batter made. Now, it's just a question of scraping this into a bowl and letting it wait for 10 minutes as well, clear up or something, just to let the starch and the flour swell a bit. All, this will all help the prawns adhere into the cakes when you fry them. Right, I'm going to put these in the fridge. See you later. Do not try this if you're under five and at home. Oh, it's beautiful, isn't it? It's I love it when they turn color, change colour. How are we doing? Oh, there we are. And you know, I do think, I know this is just my excuse, but the fact that it's deep fat, it seals it, it isn't that greasy. Oh, it's, so fat, it's, it's not fattening at all. Fat. Yeah, low fat frying. Lovely. That one looks beautiful. That one has got my name on it, I think. Okay. Mm -hmm.
Oh, that's what it is, Josh. Fried food is the nicest, isn't it? Yeah, in a very non-fat kind of way. No, I can feel this is making me lose weight as I eat it. Mm. I like the fact that you don't have to leave the scene of the crime. <laughs> <laughs> you eat as you work. I don't know why I'm drinking so much of this disgusting wine. I don't know where it goes from. No, I'm sorry, it is. It's right, it could be worse. It could come in a cardboard box, but... I... <laughs> Even if you really love cooking, often it's only at the weekend that you've really got time to throw yourself into it. This doesn't necessarily mean more elaborate food, but it certainly means more enjoyable cooking. Chicken in, please. Oh my God! <laughs> Thank you. Take the apple Saturday. We often have eggy bread as a family weekend breakfast. Now you can make eggy bread out of any stale bread, but I like make them in these star shapes, at least the children like eating them in these star shapes. And all you do is just cut them out. Mimi, do you want to dunk these? And then you just dunk the bread into eggs beaten, wait, 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 into eggs beaten with a bit of milk and some salt. I'll do one. And then you just fry them in butter. I like mine. Mm. With cinnamon, that's <laughs> enough. With cinnamon and sugar, although the children like theirs and tomato ketchup, but Cover everything. Go on yours now, Mimi. Yeah. Enough. I love the aromatic, unstructured qualities of stews and the way they look after themselves when you potter about the house at the weekend. This Greek lamb stew with pasta is one of my favourites. This is lamb shoulder, which is both cheaper and has a lot more flavour than leg. I'm using about two kilos of lamb here, which is enough to feed six to eight. That's the meat, and now the flavour base, which I think is the heart of a stew. Celery, to start. So important. Even if you don't like celery, please put some in. It adds a note that you cannot duplicate. Garlic, four fat cloves. I want this to be really gutsy. Squish the cloves just to get the skin off. It's so important to distinguish between what takes a long time to cook and what takes a long time to prepare. Because sometimes you find that dishes which take ages to cook actually involve very little effort from you, whereas some fast food thing can take 15 minutes of solid chopping. Anyway, onions, lots. Time to blitz. Great. There's some oil left from browning the meat, so I don't need to add any more oil at this stage. So in the five minutes or so my vegetable base takes to cook, I'm going to start peeling the carrots, which will not take five minutes, even with my clumsy peeling. 
The thing is, I want the flavour of carrots, all that lovely sweetness, but what I do not want is the little, little bits of chopped up carrots like school stew. So what I'm going to do is just bung them in and then retrieve them before serving the stew up. I know it sounds wasteful, but I promise you it isn't. You'll see. So that's done. And this is done. And by done, I mean, again, not coloured, just soft. Slightly translucent. But the celery adds a little greenness. Just taking half out. Spread the remaining bit of vegetable mishmash around at the bottom. Just pour the brown meat back over. It's like making a sandwich. Onion, mush, meat. Onion mush, delicious. But the reason I'm doing this, I mean, you don't have to just mix all around the, uh, however you want. The reason I'm doing this is because I feel that the onion, cooked down and pulverised a bit, seems to keep the meat moister, more succulent. And I don't want a stringy stew. Carrots. So some bay leaves, because I've got the sweetness from the carrots and I want some nice herbal quality from bay leaves and, mm, lovely, oregano, so beautiful. With stews, really don't be too hung up on, you know, is it a teaspoon or is it half a teaspoon, is it two bay leaves or is it three bay leaves, three carrots or two carrots, none of it makes any difference and you'll feel so much more liberated if you just, you know, bung things in, you know, within reason. Now, tomatoes, and I've spent all day chopping these tomatoes and putting them into cans. Now the wine, whole bottle white, partly because when I ate a stew like this in Greece it was made with white wine, but also because it's nice to change flavours. White wine can be great with meat, just as red wine with fish. And water. It is very watery at this stage, and do not get alarmed. The reason is some of the liquid will just evaporate on cooking, but also because since I'm going to be cooking some pasta with this when I reheat, I want the water there so I can cook the pasta, and of course the pasta will absorb some of the liquid. Perfect, and it's come to a boil. Let it bubble for a minute. Mm. And now, plonk a lid on, turn it right down. And leave it for a couple of hours. If, however, you want just to forget about it, not even see it in your kitchen, just bung it in a low oven. I mean, it doesn't make any difference. You're just supplying low heat to this wonderful stew for two hours and it'll be cooked whichever way you do it. Fish these carrots out. But not throw them away. Bring it up to the boil. Throw in the pasta. And this is what turns it into such a wonderful sort of one pot comfort meal. Mm. Macaroni. OK, leave that to cook and... My carrots. Some Ligurian olive oil. Molden salt. So delicious. Cook's treat. You always gotta have one of those. Mm, 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 mm. Oh, that takes about ten minutes. So much in food depends on contrast, and here, against that sweet, meaty lamb stew, I'm chopping oregano, fresh oregano. I use dried in it. And then, I've got this chopped, I'm going to crumble 
in with it some really sharp feta. Mix them, mix them together just for my hands, you know. And this sharp and herbal mix will just meld and melt into that sweet stew. She's back. She's back there. I know. I saw her at the um, at, the, at the Christmas party. Oh right, cool. Yeah, she's. Yeah. What are you doing? Yeah. Yeah. That's Christmas month. That's a Yule time. Yule Baking is a lovely thing to do at the weekend when you've got time really to inhabit the kitchen rather than just rushing through it as you do in the week. And I love this sort of cooking, especially at night when the house is quiet and I can just go about it quietly and I find it incredibly relaxing. I'm making a clementine cake now and the clementines in question have been boiled just in water for two hours until they're really soft and tender. Four or five clementines if you want to replace them with three oranges, do. You squeeze any excess liquid out of them and put them all into the processor. Skin, zest, pith, everything. You just need to be blitzed to a sort of knobbly puree. Perfect. Now this couldn't be easier. You just need 250 grams of ground almonds, 225 grams of caster sugar, heap teaspoonful of baking powder, and six eggs. The useful thing about this cake is that you use ground almonds in place of flour, so people who either can't or won't eat anything with gluten in it can eat this cake. And also it's the almonds along with the fruit that keeps this cake incredibly moist and delicious. And that means that you can make it say at the weekend when you've got the time. And then in the middle of the miserable week when you're feeling deprived and exhausted, you can come home from work and eat it. the cake batter made. You'll need a 20 centimetre spring form cake tin. It needs to be buttered around the sides and lined at the bottom because it is a moist cake. I love that reusable baking parchment but you can use whatever you want. And then just pour this batter in. And then the number five, 190 degrees centigrade oven for an hour. The cake's ready, it's had an hour. It should still be a bit sticky in the centre, but coming away at the edges. And the wonderful thing is that you leave the cake to cool in its tin on a rack, so you don't have to sit up for a bit waiting to unmould it. You just leave it there overnight. I 
proper Sunday lunch. I don't think that roast beef in Yorkshire pudding can be beaten, but you can do things differently, and I often do. This is one of my favourite variants. The beef's cold, there are a couple of salads to go with, and the Yorkshire pudding really is pudding. Now, this handsome piece of beef has already been cooked. What I did was I rubbed it with olive oil and chopped rosemary and then gave it 25 minutes a kilo in a really hot oven. But that's because I do like my beef quite underdone. If you like it more cooked, cook it for longer. You, what you should remember in any case is that the beef will carry on cooking as it cools. But I'm going to move it behind me and let it cool over here while I get on with the Yorkshire pudding. Everyone has their own way of doing Yorkshire pudding. My way is to do it backwards. That's to say, the eggs in first with the milk and then whisking in the flour later. It seems to work that way, and I know it's unorthodox, but I read about it in Jane Grigson, tried it. I've never changed my method since. And that's four eggs, by the way. 300 millilitres of milk. And on. But I love this back-to-front method. It works so well. That needs to sit for 15 minutes. I'm going to leave that and get on with the first salad, for which I need a hot griddle. Luckily, this is hot. And I know it sounds odd to have a hot griddle for a salad, but it's just that I'm going to griddle these lovely aubergines now and then let them get cool and eat them at room temperature. With griddling, the rule is always to oil the food and not the griddle. This is garlic-infused olive oil, which would be wonderful with the aubergine. And just... Turn the aubergines in the oil. They will soak up a lot of oil, but that's just because aubergines do. you just got to accept that. And it is what makes them taste so lovely. I never, ever salt them. I think people have this mad fetish about it all. I think it's true, however, that aubergines now are bred, or whatever you do to plants, to make them less bitter. But on the other hand, my mother never salted aubergines and hers never tasted soggy and they never tasted bitter. I think it's a nonsense, really. All they need now is a little more garlic oil, a squeeze of lemon, salt, this lovely coarse salt like hail, some chives and some just cracked pepper. Kind of the knobbiness seems to add to the smokiness of the aubergine. Mm. That's it. I'm going to put these down here to cool down to room temperature and back to my Yorkshire pudding mix. The eggs and milk have been standing for long enough. I'm adding flour, 250 grams, spoon by spoon. It's been sifted because I want this really light. It's easier for it to be incorporated if you go slowly. Just going to give a final scrape down to make sure all the flour is absorbed. This is the stage at which most people leave their Yorkshire pudding batters to rest, and if you want to, you can, but you don't need to. Right, that's ready to go in the oven. The real key to fabulous Yorkshire pudding is to have the oven and the fat incredibly hot, as hot as your oven will go. Mm. I use vegetable fat because the smoking point is much higher than with other fats, and so that since it's so hot, you, know, you need to be careful, you don't want to smoke out your whole kitchen. Right, and that's at 250 degrees centigrade, that's gas mark 10, and I'm going to leave it there for 15 to 20 minutes, by which time it should be just blossoming and burnished and like a huge crown. Right, beef's done, aubergine's done, pudding's in the oven. The last thing, my pea, mint and avocado salad. I love this, well, primarily because it just tastes lovely, but also because it was one of my great Aunt Myra's 1970s specials. It's just very good. These peas are frozen peas, cooked till tender, not very soft, and then macerated in olive oil, white wine vinegar, freshly chopped mint, and a pinch of sugar. I'm going to need my huge plate for this. 
And when I say huge, I do mean huge. The lettuces I use mainly here are little gems because they're really easy and also they provide lovely crunch, which is contrast to the peas. And chicory too is really a good contrast, not just because of the texture, but also because the chicory is very bitter against the sweetness of the peas, that's fabulous. And also there's a contrast in shape. Huh, perfect, everything. The oil and vinegar that are on the peas already really provide the dressing, so just tumble these over. Toss. Mm, looks so beautiful and tastes so wonderful too. Very, very useful thing to have in your repertoire. Now one last crucial ingredient for another bit of contrast, avocados, which I keep on the windowsill to try and get every last bit of light and sun and warmth to the just at the right texture these are. The thing about avocados, always buy early, use late, by which I mean if you get them early enough you can make sure that just the texture you need have got time to ripen and use them as last minute as you can just because of this colour. This is lovely. Don't worry about what shapes you make. I mean I like to use a knife and do these lovely little long boat shapes but you can use a spoon and just clump it out if you want. I don't think there is a more beautiful salad. All it needs a bit of salt. Avocados drink up salt, I suppose, because they're so divinely rich and bland. And some freshly chopped mint. Not a lot. Just enough to make the mint that's in the peas already seem to come alive. The alchemy of cooking. commend it to the house. So how divine is that? The perfect stress-free Sunday lunch. Griddled aubergine, pea mint and avocado salad and the most wonderful rare roast beef. Thinly sliced if my carving is up to it. I'm not the world's best carver but I'll try and do justice to this magnificent beast. Mm. Vegetarians turn away now. Perfect. For me, anyway. Mmm. Look at this. Magnificent. Mm. I just love this so much. Searing hot with cold thick cream and golden syrup. Just so wonderful. I know that I'm meant to be keeping this, but I have to have some now, not least to show you just how gorgeous it is. You have to see everything all together. Mm. It smells like a mixture between pancake and donut, which kind of defines pudding heaven for me. Mm. Just can't wait. Mmm, look at this. Is that you wish? Ah. Mm. No need to talk. <laughs>